Good morning. I'm going to try this again. I keep getting interrupted. <laughs> Hello. <sighs> um, I already put on my moisturizer. I put it on a little sunscreen. So far, this has been a pretty good sunscreen. Um, I already put on some foundation. Now I have the rest to do. Um, I want to say... Hello to Eileen and Carmen. Yay. Carol, Janet, Vera. Oh, thank you for about the Four Non Blonde song. I couldn't think of that title. I just love that. Um, um, I love that song. I couldn't think of the band. Now I can't think of the name. <laughs> I didn't write it down. I wrote down Four Non Blondes. Um, and Diana, thanks for the topic on meditation. I am going to, I'm going to, I think, do a few shorts on that. I don't know. Maybe today. I don't know. Let's see how it goes. Vanessa, thank you for the idea on the humidifier. I don't know what's gotten into me. Uh, I used to use one every winter, even last year, I think. So, um, I either need a new humidifier or I'm going to see if my little, you know, the thing you put oil and water in and it has a little steam that comes out. I'm going to try that beside my bed and see if that's enough humidity. Maybe not. I don't know. Hi, Bernice and Marjorie. Um... We were talking about music. The 19th Nervous Breakdown. Oh my God, girl. That song. Wow. Um, when I was a kid. Oh, and hi, Rain. That 19th Nervous Breakdown. We used to listen to the Beatles. Um, a, a girlfriend of mine in, I don't know what grade it was, for um, fifth grade maybe, introduced me to the Beatles. And I was stunned. I'm like, dang, that's music. Holy cow. Um, and I remember that. God, we used to play that over and over in our basement until our mom would scream at us, make us turn it down and come up for dinner. <laughs> that's so funny. Um, yeah. So, just wanted to give those shout outs and say hello. Mwah. Thank you for making my day. And, and, um, the encouragement and the love, it's so sweet. I have my list of things to do today. I've been chipping away at this little list for the last few days so that I could, um, do that today. And I'm telling you another beautiful fall day. I hope, I hope that's what you have. And I hope you can get out there and enjoy it before it's gone. Okay. I'm going to. I'm going to get started. One of the things about makeup, and this is what I want, I want you to do. There are so many people who just really stress about makeup. Don't try to just not stress. One of the things, I love makeup. It's so fun. Um, but not when I was big dealing it for years. I've always enjoyed it. Um, especially when it came to doing it for other people. Uh, I used to love doing makeup for other people. Oh, it was one of my fun things. I took a, a gal under my wing. Oh, a year or two ago. Gosh, it's been a while. Um, who was very vulgar and, and no offense. And, um, clownish and would switch to little girlish and then have one of those, I don't know. You see them on TV with the different colored hair and the different little head kitten ears or rainbows. And anyway, I was working with her and it's not that I want to change somebody's whole personality, but, um, she wanted to fit in. And uh, just felt like nobody liked her. And 
if they did like her, I, you know, it's like, no, oh, they weren't really good enough, you know? So there was a part of her that wanted to mature out of that and hang out with more mature people, but there was also a part of her that wanted to remain a little girl, right? And I see this a lot in my practice. So one of the things that I, I, I experiment, challenge my clients to do is experiment um, with behaviors. And they'll say, but I want to be me. I just want to be me. I'm like, okay. But I was like being mommy kind of mothering and, and, and doing her makeup for her. And she got to see how pretty she was. Oh my God. And I talked to her, begged her, pleaded to um, go more natural with her hair. And I'm telling you, people responded so strongly that she's maintained it. Right. And a lot of my clients do the same thing. They just really enjoy being taken more seriously. When we're kids, we're not taking care. We're not taking. We're not taking. Ben, we're not taken seriously. We're being used, and if we say anything that makes sense, we get shut down because ooh, don't make sense. <laughs> Don't make sense. I love this shade of orange. But I like my lipstick to match. And it's kind of hard for me to wear that much color. Oh, well. See how orange it is? I like it. It just doesn't match inside of my lips as well but it's not bad it's not bad oh goodness hmm. la, 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 la. so that being said <clears throat> Some of the interesting things about um, being ourselves and not a mask of ourselves. Sometimes it's very challenging to figure out who we are when we've been pretending to be someone else for a long time. Too much color. <laughs> mm. That's all right. Uh. So sometimes it's hard to decide if we're going to act like a child when we get mad or like an adult. And sometimes we don't know ourselves. We feel uncomfortable in the world. Insecure, unloved. Sometimes it's good to just simply start with fake it till you make it. You don't have to feel like an adult. You don't have to um, feel like you have all the answers or you're not an adult. What I will encourage you to, to do, and it's sort of... um. Albert Ellis, rational, behavioral, um, emotional therapy, emotive therapy. It's where, <laughs> there's Frankie. Uh, it's, part of it is, you know, like where years ago, Nike had a slogan, fake it till you make it. I think it was Nike. Oh, he's going to be on a rant. I'll be right back. Don't go anywhere. You know you're not allowed to bark in the house like that. I don't know why you're asking me that. No bark. Behave. Okay. I'm back. Sorry about that. Good girl. 
grief. All right, so part of what's going on is people think they have to be perfect at all this. Sometimes the fake it till you make it is exactly what your brain needs to help resolve issues, right? One of the things we do when we're a kid, we're shut down. We're shut down over and over and over again to where our brain doesn't know what it's like to resolve something. And our human brains like cases to be closed. We like finished. We like to be able to accept that something's over or something's beginning. We mark ceremony with events with ceremonies uh, like funerals. Uh, a lot of times if we don't go to a funeral, don't get to go, it's almost like we have an anger that we got cheated out of saying goodbye. You know, that's where some good therapy comes in because sometimes we don't get to do that, right? Sometimes we just gotta um, decide we've had closure, so. Anyway, if our brain doesn't get to complete something over and over and over again as a young child, sometimes what we do is disassociate. So if I don't get closure on something or I feel like I'm up against a, a wall where I can't be heard, um, that frustration is so bad, one of the things we do is numb out. And uh, some people call it disassociation. I call it folding over. Right? There, most, most people don't, don't know this. And I don't understand the DSM. Because most people who disassociate, they simply have uh, neural pathways that haven't been trained to pay attention and stay in the game because they've been taught that it's not worth it. And if they don't shut the hell up, there's gonna be a problem. So what they do is they kinda, of, you can just kinda of numb out. Like you do if you're trying to do pain control. Like you do at a certain level when you're doing meditation. You shut things out and you just go, you just go silent. Um, so with that being said, um, The deal is sometimes that's a very useful tool. Problem is the brain really likes meditation. It really does. If you find the type of meditation that fits your brain or the type of blocking out, the brain likes that, especially when it's been overstressed. It's kind of like your brain goes, oh my God, did I die and go to heaven? <laughs> and you'll notice that um, it's sort of like if you stare at something long enough and you're quiet and you just kind of zone out. And some people can do it so well, you actually lose track of time. You can actually, like meditation, hear something maybe physically, but you're not connecting to it mentally. Well, a lot of people, believe it or not, overemphasize their daydreaming and call it disassociation. And because somebody has to say, hey, 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 I'm right here. I'm trying to talk to you, right? You'll go, oh, I was disassociating. Well, you could be disassociating. If you want to keep a diagnosis like that, that's fine. But really, how about changing it to, oh, I was really enjoying spacing out there for a while, right? And if you do it a lot, you do it often, and it's a really strong habit where you think you don't even have control over it, we got to up the game. Got to up the game. As soon as you feel like you're spacing out, stop it. Get in the game. Clap. Move around. Move your body. Touch something. Smell something. Spray some room freshener, light a candle, put on some music, move your shoulders around, kind of wake up, wake up, wake up. 
and then try to think of something peaceful, nice, you know. And if you're blanking out, this is disassociating, daydreaming, because you're trying to escape a conversation or a chore or suicide, talk to somebody. Talk to somebody. Because a lot of the times it's just lack of tools. You don't know what you don't know. Oh, gosh. Where do these crazy eyebrows come from? I am the hairiest person. It's funny. I've, I've heard people say that. Uh, a lot of men, where they'll have all this hair on their chest and back and their legs. And they won't have any on their head. And they're so frustrated. Poor things. We really do highly invest in hair. You know, I've heard uh, people say, oh, my hair's my identity. Well, it's too bad that we do that. I mean, I've, I've done it too. I do not like how I look in short hair. That's why I'm lucky that I can grow it long. However, I can tell you this, because I've had short hair and had to live with it in that growing out stage, I also know that I could live with it. And personally, it's not my identity um, as far as I'm concerned. And you know how I know that? Because I've, I've met people that knew me in second grade that I didn't even remember because I was under so much stress. And the thing they'd say is, oh, you still have that long hair. So it may be somebody else's identification of me, but it's not how I identify myself. I like it a lot. It is part of my look. But I don't remember ever identifying myself. When somebody said, explain how you look, um, I almost always go for the um, weird eyes, hardly any lips. <laughs> Cracker white, um, white hair, but I, I, I guess I don't think about the length so much. Isn't that weird? Okay, anyway, back to the subject. <laughs> I got that uh, spacing out. No, ADHD, maybe. Okay, so disassociation habit for me. I even wrote it down. One of the, you know, when you unplug like that, one of the common complaints is when someone who, who unplugs like that often is, I just don't fit in anywhere. I don't feel like I belong anywhere. And that's, you know, we unplug because of the pain, confusion, frustration. Um, or trying to unplug from experiencing a bad event that's going on. The issue is it's so habit forming that then uh, the person can feel like an alien. So when you talk about people who can fall for an addiction or a cult or um, obsessive behaviors like addictions, um, it's because the brain likes the escape so much that they'll overfocus, overthink certain behaviors, overcommit to certain things that aren't necessarily productive. Uh, that's for sure. So, think about it. Google defense mechanisms. See which, see which one is your tool of choice. And if it is um, the detachment, um, disassociation, you can decide whether you want to do the DSM definition or, you know, whatever. Or you can decide to do some homework and exercises to see if you can... Um, 
start feeling the rewards of making a commitment to yourself. A commitment and loyalty and self-discipline to be your own caretaker. That's some serious shit right there. That's what your parents should have done. Right? They should have protected you. I'm not trying to beat up anybody. But if you disassociate a lot, someone didn't protect you. Right? Someone isolated you. That's my, that's my firm belief. I'm just being straight with you. From my professional and personal experience, healthy people don't normally disassociate. Ever. <laughs> Why would they? Why would they cut out part of their life experiences? Uh, it's usually people who have some reason to completely unplug people who enjoy life there's no reason to do that well why would you from my experience there's no real medical reason for anybody to do that and there's there are people who this is the honest to god truth i have had clients who have been labeled with disassociation dissociative personality disorder and not one of them that wanted to start experiencing life wasn't able to do it. I'm I'm an example as well. I was called a daydreamer in I don't know uh every grade that I can remember. And uh if she would just stop daydreaming, she's a bright girl. She'd do fine. Yeah, well, it was such, it was such a handy tool that as the teacher was teaching and it would just start getting monotonous or a little boring and all of a sudden I'd be looking out the window or daydreaming about how my pencil was manufactured, seriously, in, in grade school or, or counting the tiles this way and that way and then trying to figure out how many that made or how many deaths this way and how many deaths that way. So I wasn't always numb. I was just spacing out. Uh, some people do get numb and I did that often as well. Goat hairs. Good grief. Every time I pull a girl hair, say hi grandma. <laughs> so... Some people aren't going to like what I say, but I can tell you there are other therapists who who follow, uh, who led me to believe that experimenting with disassociative disorder was a good idea. And that how people were underdiagnosed with disassociative disorder. And I'm thinking, you know, it's it's a lot more common. And people who have it... You know, it's such a strong diagnosis. People feel broken. And I'm just so so tired of that DSM um, diagnostic tool that uh, I think it should be banned. Completely rewritten. But it's it's handy for insurance companies. It's a way to cut back on paying bills. Paying your bills. I don't know. I used to get into the politics of all that when I was young. <laughs> I used to feel a lot more passionate about it. And wanted to be involved in making changes. And now I'm just like. Changes don't happen. Quickly. Enough for me. And some changes are too lucrative. So they're not going to change. They're just not going to. So. I'm, I'm done wasting my time. 
don't give up the fight. Oh, shut up. You, you don't know. <laughs> if you think that some of these fights are worth fighting, you don't know who you're up against. Big money. Big pharma. Big pharma. Do you know how much money people make off of depression and anxiety when really what people need is love and support and encouragement and discipline and commitment and loyalty to themselves? They need to be taught these things and people are being prescribed things that just sort of help them disassociate, help them bow out, help them, um, you know, and I'm saying thank God for that. I, I often, and not often, but I occasionally encourage my clients to, you know, talk to their doctor about something for their anxiety or depression, just long enough for us to work through some things, six months, a year, maybe two years. And then we can reevaluate it. Um, it. It's important to have medication if you need it. So don't don't think that I'm trying to say get off all medication because that's not me. I think a little bit of medication can, or sometimes a lot. I don't know what. It, however you want to judge it, um, is good for people who have such deep neural pathways that it looks like some of those may or may not be able to change. That's not in the normal range. It's not in the clients that I work with, but it is in the range of people who have um, bipolar, borderline, schizophrenia. Sometimes those those neural pathways need such intense um, inpatient or intensive outpatient treatment to really help some folks stay on track. And um, that might be a lifelong commitment but that's not the normal range. Those are outliers. And um, I mean, if I had schizophrenia or borderline or bipolar, I would definitely want to be in a group home. I wouldn't want to live by myself. I might want to say that, <laughs> but I would become too unruly left to myself, I think. And you know, it's so easy to fall for, well, I'm not gonna take my medication and then they're off and running again. Um, Woohoo! <laughs> I'm serious. I've worked, when I was younger, I had the energy to work with people who have bipolar and borderline and mild schizophrenia, but I just don't have it now because most of the time they will not stay on their medication. And some people, like I said, need the medication to help them slow down enough or connect some um, receptor sites enough that our therapy makes sense to them, right? And so they don't have to be reintroduced to me every time, right? Some people are, have been, had such events in their life that they, they have to warm up to you every time. Yeah. Anyway, back to um, um, defense mechanisms. The disassociation is a big deal. Just try not to use that term if you can and get to know it and see if you do it. And we'll talk, talk about another um, defense mechanism another time. But I really like that one because I like to talk about that one because I've experienced it myself growing up. It was hard for me to snap out of it because it was like taking a mini vacation. Uh, and it was hard to stop. I hardly ever do it anymore. Hardly ever. Um, I do other things that cause me <laughs> stress. The thing is, if we don't stop overusing defense mechanisms, the body keeps the score. The body knows. And that tension and stress adds up and adds up and adds up. And it's the stress around our chest that is... You know, people call it hypertension, anxiety, ugh, um, stroke. You know, be careful because the body keeps the score. It's one of my favorite sayings. Who was that? Peter Levine who came up with that? I'll have to Google it or something. I forgot more than I've ever learned sometimes. But when we are using a defense mechanism like disassociation, um, I call it bowing out, bow, bending over, bending over. <laughs> it's like you're 
you're ducking, ducking over. So um, you're like avoiding everything that's going on and you're just like, I'm not here, I'm not here. <clears throat> well, problem is your brain knows everything's going on and it also knows you don't have a way to resolve what's going on and still feel safe. So that builds up the stress and frustration. And that's the same with any any of the defense mechanisms. If it if it's yelling and screaming, you know, that's the um oh remission, regression. I get those mixed up. Where you start going back in age, like temper tantrums. God damn it, what are you doing? What are you? it's like okay, that's a three year old behavior. I don't care how angry you are, how self-righteous your your anger is, how qualifying um, outrage is. That kind of behavior is three-year-old behavior. It's not adult conversation. And many people fall into that one because they're trying so hard to be heard and they're, and they're fighting for the right to be heard. And, and so they just end up using that tool all the time. The yelling and screaming or fighting or snotty or sarcastic or whatever. And once again, it's not dealing in a reasonable way with what's going on. We're not being heard as an adult. So I know this is, this can be a tough subject. I know that for sure. Cause it was tough for me. <laughs> my, my, uh, I was in, um, IOP, intensive outpatient treatment for my drug and alcohol recovery. Oh my God, I learned so much, but it took me years to really refine any of my tools other than staying sober. I got that one down really hard. I mean, I have a whole list of things that I can do to keep me sober. And those are the ones that I got ingrained in my head. I was committed and self-disciplined enough to stay committed, right? Um, but they sent out this printout to add to our little kit of tools and homework. And we were sent home to, you know, circle them, write them down for discussion, and then how we've used it or how much we use it or whatever. And I was like, oh my God, there was probably 20 different, maybe, or I know 15 different defense mechanisms on there. And I used a lot of them. I hardly had a conversation. Excuse me. I hardly had a conversation with anyone that wasn't packed with my defense mechanism tools. I hardly ever had a genuine conversation that was in the moment, that was real. It was an effort to get my needs met, even if there wasn't an appropriate situation where I would get my needs met. <laughs> I don't know. I gotta go, but um, we'll talk about this some more. Um, sometime and and just know how much I appreciate any comments um, also flower um, you sent me a little message about um, Ms. I think at Olson I looked her up on the internet and I saw that little video oh my god how heartbreaking and then as I but right above that, which would have made it more recent, there was a beautiful picture of, her, of a lady who, same name, and it was showing her funeral. Um, I don't know if it was the same lady, because when we're in the process of dying, um, our faces really change, because our brain isn't sending, in my opinion, the brain isn't sending the messages to contain these certain muscles it just starts um and we start dehydrating um and losing weight 
So, I don't know if it's the same lady. It could have been. I don't know who took that video. Um, her channel only had that one short. And the date was a year, a, around a year ago. And that's when that funeral one was also put out. So, I don't know if she passed away. But I don't see any way to find out any more information about her. Thank you for bringing that up because things like that are concerning. I mean, if she would respond, I saw you left a sweet little message. Oh, bless your heart. And um, um, thank you for the heads up in case I could have done anything about it. But the, the way I looked into it, I didn't even leave another message because that video was a year ago. And if someone, I mean, she didn't take that video herself. There were no other videos. Um, I just feel like someone else posted that. I don't know. See, my brain will go to paranoia really quick. And I'm just thinking, oh my God. Hmm. You know what? Maybe I will... ask around and how to dig in a little deeper to find out her location or identity because uh, if I can I'll, I'll do what I can to find someone to go check on her if she's not you know within driving distance anyway love y'all I have to get on my list look at this list lots of stuff oh yeah I gotta get on this list <laughs> Mwah. Love you. Bye for now.